Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to me to be here with Professor Manuel Montero Dasso. Manuel is a friend, a colleague, a geriatrician, and uh, he nowadays is a professor of the Department of Medicine, Epidemiology, and Biostatistic, director of Gate and Brain Lab in Paraguay Institute, Division of Geriatric Medicine, faculty scholar at the University of Western Ontario, and a scientist Lawson Research Health Institute too, and is the vice president of the Canadian Gerontological and Geriatric Society. For me, it's a pleasure to present Manuel. As I said, he uh, will talk to all of us about falls and some uh, important remarks uh, about the false global guidelines that uh, uh, he and, and a very interesting group are performing nowadays from coming from a lot of countries in the world. And uh, of course, uh, in our concern uh, from Manuel and to me too, it's a pleasure to uh, honor in these conferences uh, uh, to our professor in geriatrics, Professor Roberto Kaplan, that uh, was one of the key persons in our professional life. So, Manuel, please go, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Harry, for your kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for attending to this lecture. This lecture is entitled in honor of Professor Roberto Kaplan, uh, one of the pioneers of genetic medicine in Argentina and Latin America. And today I will speak about falls and cognition. I will review the evidence, assumptions, and therapeutic options. Here I have a picture with my mentor in Argentina, Professor Roberto Kaplan. Unfortunately, now uh, is retired due to cognitive impairment and dementia but he has been key in developing all our training and also to foster several gener generations of the geriatrician in Argentina. So I would like to dedicate this talk to my mentor and friend, Professor Roberto Kaplan. I don't have anything to disclose and the objectives today of my talk are going to go to review the role of cognitive deficits in fall risk in other adults to address assumptions and uh, how we approach current fall prevention management and to appraise the role of cognitive treatment as a strategy to reduce risk of falls in older people. What is the connection about falls and cognition? Well, this picture is depicting Desmond Morris. Desmond Morris was a zoologist and ethologist at Dolphin University and he brought a lovely book, The Naked Ape, that Professor Roberto Kaplan gave me when I was a young uh, general internist in the Italian hospital, and I was uh, considering the idea to pursue uh, an specialization in genetic medicine. And when Roberto shared this book to me, he told me, focus here how human development is key to understand how will we get older, our cognition and mobility decline. And in one of the first chapters, Desmond Morris in this book had the following quote. One is speaking about the Asian ape before evolving to human beings. And is that Asian ape was able to keep his body in the upright position, to move his hands in one way and their feet in another, and to keep improving his brain and use his mind as best as possible he stood a chance of success. Basically, in the evolution, human beings not necessarily were created to be the dominant species. Particularly, an important achievement was the encephalization process. And it seemed in order to develop this brain by pedalism, so to keep the upright position was key. In other words, there is a phylogenetic gait and cognition association. The process of bipedalism took at least five million years. And in this process, at the end, we develop also bigger brains that we call encephalization. So bipedalism, it seems, 
is close related to encephalization. Anthropological studies have shown that for the early hominid transition to the modern hominid, I think was around the Homo habilis, in where you know our brain size was very similar to the ancient apes. But at that moment, before going to Homo erectus, the Asian hominid spent the majority of the time in two feet and has some modifications in order to walk all the time, right, and to crawl. And with the development of this um, bipedalism, the size of the brain increased, double the size. And to reach, you know, the new hominids like the Neanderthalis and also sapiens, and the sapiens sapiens, our current species. So it seems in this period, almost 1.5 million years in the evolution, the bipedalism was a pre necessary requisite to get bigger brain size. There is a little, several explanations about that. Some simple explanation, okay, by pedaling, you are able to release your hands, come hunting, change your diet. Independently of the reason, there is several contentions. All today, all the anthropologists agree that by pedaling was a fundamental adaptation in order to get bigger brains in civilization and it happened 1.5 years before that process. But also, it seems there is an ontogenetic relation on gait and cognition, particularly in the decline. So this process that happened in a species in the human evolution in one single individual can decline because can be only 80 years in our mobility and our cognition decline, and the consequences are falls and fractures, but also cognitive impairment. In fact, when I want to describe what I think, what makes a person to look old, I think those for clinicians like myself that we see patients, all the people, they have a slow mobility, particularly a slow walking speed or a slow gait. But importantly, they have like a low cognition of mental slow with our processing speed, our attention, or executive function is not as fast as we're younger. And more importantly, those two conditions that happen with aging and diseases associated with aging sometimes concur, happen both together in the same individual. In 2016, with my colleague, Professor David Hogan, we were chairing the False Interest Group of the Canadian Justice Society. And we tried to address which are the gaps in our understanding of fall management and prevention. And one of the topics that we highlighted was cognition. Um, we question ourselves, why are falls so common in the cognitive impair? Why does fall prevention not work as good in this population like in the cognitive healthy population? Are we assuming facts? Are we missing a treatment component when we do those preventions? And we don't want to reinvent the wheel because already one of the fathers of modern genetic medicine, Bernard Isaacs, published in the 70s in Age and Aging, that Unfortunately, cognitive impairment is an important cause for falls, and falls can be seen as a manifestation of brain failure. But Bernard Isaacs asked himself, can anything practical be done other than to avoid obstacles or avoid polymedications to prevent falls in this population? Even he speculates the possibility of pharmacological treatment for fall prevention. And that was quite revolutionary. As you can imagine, at that moment, polymedications and medications were against fall prevention. In, in, in fact, in order to prevent fall, we want to take medications out or to reduce inappropriate medications. And also it's a current approach, but he allowed him to intellectually challenge himself and to speculate, can we test some medications improving cognition or processing speed? to reduce the rate of falls in the cognitive impair. And why we're treating this topic today in the Roberto Kaplan lecture? Well, because falls are quite, quite prevalent in people with cognitive impairment, particularly in people with dementia, it's double. Double that you compare the incidence with people without dementia. But not only people with cognitive impairment and dementia have more falls, they have more risk of having an injury and a fracture after the falls for several reasons, probably because they have less, for example, 
uh, defenses reflexes or, or, or they have they are more frail and not only they have more injuries and fractures but the functional outcomes after a fall deteriorate more and more quickly they have less access to rehabilitation in some countries and some systems very difficult to access to rehabilitation they have higher prevalence to better and to get it institutionalized or going to nursing home after a fall because they have dementia and they have more mortality higher mortality we compare with the cognitive healthy so as you can see it's not just the prevalence of falls and the incident increase but as all these negative consequences are much much more common in people with cognitive impairment and dementia and to make the matter worse, fall prevention is not as successful in this population as is in the cognitive healthy or the cognitive non impaired population. A typical meta analysis, and this has been corroborated in new studies, was done by Oliver and published in the British Medical Journal in 2007, in where he analyzed all the multifactorial interventions, particularly in residential care, so nursing home to prevent falls. And you can see in this meta analysis, there is a trend to prevent falls probably around 8% prevention, but look at the confidence interval, they crossed the one, so it was not significant. And still today, this is quite, uh, I would say, expressing the evidence. It's very difficult to get very good successful false prevention in this population. And why? Well, there's a clear role of COVID impairment for risk, uh, but interesting, two years ago, 10 years ago, uh, my former postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Samuel Hunter, she want to put the number, she want to analyze particularly in the community, which is the hazard ratio and the ratio. And in this meta-analysis, she found that being cognitive impaired increased your risk to have a false and a serious injury almost 2.3, more than 2.3. So almost double, more, more than double. Importantly, if you analyze not only global cognition, but you look for domain, the domain of cognition that was um, more uh, associated with future fault was poor performance executive function. Not only have a very low executive function, but also in some populations, in some studies, it was found that participants being cognitive healthy but with low performance in executive function compared with those with high performance, they suffer more falls and also more injuries than falls. And interestingly, the, the serious injury, as I say, was 2.3. Uh, and the variability across the study is very low. So it, it seems a very robust strong meta analysis. In fact, we conclude in the systematic review with Dr. Moore Hunter that probably executive function should be assessed as part, as part of the fall risk assessment. And just to show you one of the studies, this is a study uh, run by Herman and the group of Jeffrey Hauser in Tel Aviv, in where they included 262 older adults that they followed for two years, and those people that were without cognitive impairment, but they did some neuropsychological testing, and they found that those with worse performance in the executive function, 50% may suffer a fall after two years, while those with better performance in the executive function only 21%. And that was true also for the second fall, for the time to second fall. So having lower performance under normal ranges, but lower performance in executive function, not only predict the first fall and the time to the first fall, but also it's an important predictor of the second fall. And several studies have corroborated these findings since then. And today I would say is widely accepted. But how the cognitive deficits may increase risk of falls at earliest changes? What is the relationship between gait and cognition? Well, uh, in a classical paper we published uh, in, 10 years ago, we found that we, we tried to describe this relationship and, and we analyzed the known relation about mobility impairment as an important predictor of falls and fractures and cognitive impairment as an important predictor of dementia. Clinicians like ourselves, we found that we, for having those faults and fractures, we slow down. We slow down our gait speed. Slow gait speed. And before having dementia, we have some cognitive impairment that we can, I would say, qualify a mild cognitive impairment. Importantly, in our clinical practice, it's not uncommon when we receive in our hospital or our clinic someone with faults and fractures, we make a new diagnosis 
of cognitive impairment dementia and vice versa when we meet someone with dementia we can see they have previous history of false and fractures that perhaps are unknown so this relation here i would say is very well known for every clinician seeing normal people but something we speculate and we try to demonstrate in our research but other group is that relationship between mobility problems and cognitive problems is started much much earlier than the seven or eight decades right in your 60s in your 50s importantly we found clear associations between how this is low in mobility may predict more cognitive impairment and vice versa how low cognition in some domains like executive function as they said before may predict for false and fractures and this relation between is low gait and low cognition again it's touched much earlier that what is fully manifested as false fractures of dementia so there is like a continuum here um and what is that because when i was in medical school in the 80s i was taught in neurology that walking is automatic we don't need our cortex or high cognitive process to walk and that is because all those uh, research in, in in walking and the regulation of walking had been done in a model with the decorted cat they put the cat the animal in a treadmill they cut the connection between the high cortex with the basic ganglia and the cat keep walking because they found you know some centers in the spine that call center of path generators that maintain the rhythm and the pace in cats but interestingly in the late 90s Lundin Olson also from scandinavia she was working in a nursing home and she noticed that some people some residents in the nursing homes before going from the running room to the rehab gym, they need to stop to say hello to her, while others were able to walk and to say hello, good morning, Dr. London also. And she was asking herself, why some of my clients or patients, they need to stop to speak to me and say good morning, while others are able to walk and talk at the same time? Is this because is it because some of them are more polite the other ones well he, he she, she she followed those those patients and she found this some the following in this graph we we we, we see in the y-axis the proportion of people without falls at time zero and we have a follow-up up to six months in the x-axis and we can see those participants that were able to talk and walk at the same time in the dotted line, only 20% suffer a fall after six months. While those older adults in that residency, they were not able to talk and walk at the same time. They need to stop walking when talking. 80% suffer a fall. And he called this like a stop walking with talking test. And she compared with other tests and the predicted value was 80% for a fall and with the highest specificity 90%. But when she went to analyze those participants, the majority of those, sorry, have some kind of impairment, particularly 26 of them have dementia. So this is particularly true in those uh, having cognitive impairment. And when she compared this test with other complex tests, but the form of the entity test, she found that the predictive value specificity was much better. Anyway, this was a very seminal paper, a small sample, 1997. This, Lundin also replicated in 100 participants, all the studies have replicated that. And today, we do know the association between stop walking when talking as a cognitive interface as a risk of falls. But I think we can now say, yes, there is a relation between gait and cognition. And in fact, our patients often explain that fall when they become distracted, when they don't pay attention, they don't pay the high level of cognition, like attention when walking, or when they need to switch attention or perform multiple tasks, like being in the kitchen or the bathroom. Importantly, which are the cognitive domains associated with fall? Well, as I said before, executive function is a classic domain, but several studies, and this is a very busy slide, but it's an excellent review published by the group of Morris and uh, all the researchers in Newcastle that show a clear correlation associated with global cognition and several impairments in, domain, in domains of gait, like the speed, the variability, the rhythm, the asymmetry, and also the postural control. And of course, executive function 
is the most likely domain being involved, and this compares several studies. Uh, green dots are studies that show associations, red dots are studies that don't show those associations, but you can see global cognition, executive function, attention are very, very well related with, with this, the speed. But also memory. There is some study showing that memory, language, and processing speed are associated. So there are several domains. It is not only executive function that may be related to slowing gait, altering the pace, and increasing the variability or the asymmetry. In fact, I want to, you, to show a couple of videos. This is a patient of my clinic. This video was done in 2007. This is a gentleman with mild cognitive impairment. Unfortunately, he developed dementia and 12 years later he passed away. But at this moment, I was testing his gait while talking. Basically, I asked his gentleman to walk and do calculations, subtracting seven by 100. So 100 by 793 and so on. Here we see the single task walking. As you can see, when I asked this gentleman to walk, his walk, I would say it's almost normal. We can see the footprints detected by this computer cell gate mat. Um, he has a good pace, good stride. It looks quite symmetric. Interesting description of the arms. No, I would say almost a normal gait. Again, when I asked this gentleman to walk and do those calculations uh, doing the serial subtraction by seven, you can see in this video that the patient start correcting, but later on it slow down a little bit. In the middle, hesitate, make a short step, follow with a longer step. The excursion of the hand is not very well uh, presented. And you can see that it's a clear asymmetry in the footprints. Although you can, you can see this at the naked eye. It's not easy to see all the time this variability of the naked eye. And I will put the two videos at the same time so you can compare both. And you can see this walking while talking is much slower. Here I finish it walking. You can compare the asymmetry. And in fact, if you compare the speed, just the normal usual gait was around 1.5 meters per second, good speed. The variability of the asymmetry was below 3%. While doing the serial calculation by sevens, the speed went down to almost 40%, one, one, one meters per second. And the variability increased by 13%. And this difference between the speed in the single task while the speed and dual task guide or gate or when they are doing the walking and talking, we call the cost, the dual task cost, how much cost to our walking to get it, our brain distracted or to get in a stress activity in the brain. And there's a formula how to calculate this difference and it's in this different in this gender was at 30%. So there is a 30% reduction in the gate speed or 30% increase in the, in the variability too. And how this work, this gate or dual task gate paradigm? Well, in single task, you activate the prefrontal cortex, the parietal lobe, but also the cerebellum. When you do calculations, you activate also some area of the parietal cortex and the, and, and the prefrontal cortex. And it seems when you do both activities at the same time, you share resources. So some areas in the prefrontal cortex are important for the navigation or attention of walking are also important to do this calculation as in the parietal law. And it seems when those areas, we don't have enough resources to share to the switch in attention, our gait may suffer or our cognition, depending on the priority we do in the test, right? So in other words, when we walk without any stress in our brain, when we focus in walking, we don't get distracted, we don't count, you know, our automaticity is very high. The variability of the asymmetry is very low. The attentional load is minimum. We are not getting distracted. And the risk of falling is very low. However, when we get distracted or we try to do more than one thing at the same time, we move in this line to a higher attentional load with our walking become less automatic because we need to watch where we're going because our default network cannot focus on that because we're doing other activity, and the variability of the asymmetry increase, posing this patient or this individual at a higher risk of fall. And that was an explanation we tried to provide about this. But in other words, we do know that dual task paradigm is not only important for research purposes, but also 
because the dual task paradigm reflects <clears throat> reflect clearly activity of the daily living because the majority of the activity of daily living involves doing two activities, sometimes three activities at the same time. So imagine being in the shower, trying to get the shower and to open a tap, or while cooking and getting a phone call and so on. And importantly, the majority of the falls in all the people happen with injury, happen at home, and, and it happens in, in places like uh, the bathroom, the bathroom, the kitchen, where sometimes we do multitasking. <clears throat> in other words, walking is very cognitive demanding. So imagine when you try to cross Young Street here in Toronto, a very busy street, or when you want to do that in the winter, you need to be careful of not sleeping in the snow or, or, or to try to avoid the cobblestone. Or imagine you to do when managing a device like a walker that is can be quite a challenge, you know, when to press the brake in the walker and so on. So basically, walking is a quantity demanding task. Um, but how this gait cognition interaction increase the risk of falls? What the issue about, for example, obstacle negotiation, leap variability, and so on? Well, my former postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Federico Faria now he's adjunct professor of medicine, he wants to see, he wanted, and he still wants, but he wanted in this experiment to see how all of those were dealing with the obstacle negotiation. So when they face an obstacle, when they're walking, and how the steps and the pressure may vary. And he created this device, this apparatus that they put in the middle of this walkway. And you know, you have people walking and you have an obstacle and you record before the obstacle and after the obstacle. And he found the following. He found that when you walk in the unobstructed area, fallers are not fallers. So all the adults, same age, sex, but with history of falls, they do quite similar about the asymmetry of the variability of the gate. Fallers may have a little higher variability around four. But that difference, how the gate variability increased, was much, much more marked when they need to negotiate with an obstacle. So no fallers, they try to overcome the obstacle, increasing the validity by 5%, but fallers, they become more hesitating. The asymmetry increased by almost 70%, and that difference was significant. And <clears throat> that happened not only in the step time variabilities, not, not only the timing, but also in the leg. So, that asymmetry is about distance and time, both of them. And you can understand that we do know high variability put more instability with more asymmetric. So that can be a factor that people that cannot uh, negotiate very well an obstacle may trip and fall. And he did the same, but now in people with cognitive impairment, particularly with mild cognitive impairment, which is a pre-dementia state. And he asked those people to deal with that obstacle, not only by walking, but also while doing dual tasking, while doing calculations as before. So in some point, it was a triple tasking activity, just the walking, dealing with the obstacle, plus talking, right? Triple tasking. And he found that, um, there is, um, in the gate speed, for example, he couldn't find a lot of changes of the gate speed altering before the obstacle were single tasking in those that are going to normal versus those with MCI. MCI here is gray, going to normal dark gray. While dual tasking, those with MCI, mild cognitive impairment, they increase and they, 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 they decrease the speed a lot. So they, they couldn't manage very well the speed. And the same with the variability. In fact, they didn't show this, this acceleration that you should see when going to an obstacle. It's in the people with MCI, they couldn't change or decelerate correctly. So posing them at higher risk of falls. So there is connotations about the speed before negotiating the obstacle and the variability in where those with cognitive impairment, they did worst compared with this cognitive normal. So very interesting for Federico Faria 
by Pogon Telefero. He later on tried to map those associations, and he found that those in longitudinal follow-up up to seven years in the study, including more than 100 people with cognitive impairment, that those that show a decline in gait speed have more fault, but also more uh, problems in rhythmic domains related with high cortex control, related to the control of the prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex. And the same for variability. Other domains were not involved. So he speculated in this paper that high cognitive domains associated with rhythmicity are important for the automatic control, but those high cortical domains associated with no rhythmicity, those related more with the gate speed, with the variability that depends more on the cortex, are more related to fall and associated with future falls. When he look which are the brain areas, in this analysis, we have some trends, but the only positive area was atrophy in the left hypogam. Well, it makes sense because those people, the majority have MCI, right? Mild current impairment, which is a memory issue in general, a single domain, was, was associated with problems in the, in the left hippocampus in, in these uh, volumetric studies in the imaging. One of my fellows at the moment, Dr. Jonathan Sneer, he was more focused on why matter. He wants to say, okay, those they have more falls or gait uh, variability or problem while, while tasking, are those having more white matter disease? And, and we, he was looking because in generally our study was done in people with normal, normal cognition or just mild MCI. There were not a lot of vascular changes. He, he, he was looking for early changes, particularly the integrity, the integrity of the pathway, the white matter int integrity. And he found in, in those participants that those that we have worse white matter integrity particularly in the corpus callosum, they have more, <clears throat> uh, gay, they develop more gait impermanent falls. And, and, and that was quite more marked for those that couldn't perform very well the dual tasking. Those participants have more effect. Look at this tractography tra here. All this impairment and lack of integrity in the white matter, particularly in the callosum, in those people that couldn't do very well the dual tasking. Um, when he went for the voxels, he found very, very well across the callosum, the corpus callosum, how the low integrity, particularly in dominant, in dominant hemisphere, the majority of people were right hand for the left one, was associated with falls in the sample, but also with gait disturbances, with slowing gait. So he, he postulated that poor white matter integrity in the corpus callosum, particularly as a proxy of white matter disease they have yet, he found was a predictor of falls, but also fall incidents after three years of follow-up. So it seemed there is a relation to how this white matter regulates gait and how this predicts falls. We don't know it's just directly the white matter generating changes that increase the risk of fall or it's mediated by gait performance. Anyways, I think that give us very good insight. There is some structural changes in some areas of the brain that are important for cognition and gait that may explain this neurobiology of the falls. But how this cognition and executive process that in general relies in the, in, in the prefrontal area affect gait as posture before fall, before the obstacle negotiation, or where have a perturbation? Well, the typical model of perturbation is that in general, when we suffer a perturbation, we have some anticipatory postural adjustment, right? And there is two main strategies, the trunk mobility and the ankle hip strategy. So if our center of gravity is displaced because someone pushes us or we get a little unstable, the first way to cope with that is moving the ankle. So we try to displace our center of gravity in the middle of our base of support. And, and that perturbation is important and, and we cannot uh, manage that, we do the hip strategy. We, we, we mow our posture towards or laterally uh, through the hips in order to maintain our body and center of gravity under this, center, under this base of support. However, that is not enough 
we need to use or oh, automatic we use other strategies like the stepping strategy we're going to fall we do one step we increase one step in order to avoid falling um for example a cane can be seen as an extra step because they give you an extra leg um that's other strategy of course if we cannot avoid the fall for the stepping strategy and we're going to fall because we do the stepping but for we don't have the strength in our quadrants to support our body and our displacement of the center of gravity is much, much beyond of the base of support we have some brisk reaction we try to grab you know a hand with handrail just to don't fall or we use later on we're falling some protective defense mechanism or protective reaction we put our hand in order to avoid the fall and perhaps that's the reason we suffer a lot with bridge fractures or put fracture so these are all the strategies that biomechanically we try to generate when we have some perturbation and we try to keep our center of gravity, uh, yes, our center of gravity under a basic support. Of course, for all those strategies, it's very important the sensory inputs because we need to hear and to watch where we place our foot and so on. And it's very important to have very flexible joints, muscle weakness, it's other uh, uh, conditions that may affect that, Parkinson may affect that. So all those are chronic conditions because you have the sensory input chronically, you have the muscle weakness is not acute in general. So are all cognitions that affect all those reflexes? So you can imagine. However, we do know that executive function attention is very important for real time for those strategies. Because any of those strategies, if you place your foot few centimeters incorrectly or you place it in those strategies few milliseconds after or before we need to do it that may be the difference between falling and not falling so all these strategies all these anticipatory postural adjustments rely a lot in processing speed executive function and attention so when you have deficit in these may affect those strategies and I will affect how you try to avoid an obstacle, how you want to try, try to avoid a trip, or how you are going to not have very good reflexes when you need to increase your base of support because you have an external perturbance and you will fall. So I try to make the case that cognition is very important for force, not only in those with cognitive impairment, but also in those labeled as like cognitive normal. So what about if we treat cognition, if we try to improve cognition, if we purposely target cognition to improve mobility and falls, can we reduce falls? Well, I will try to review the evidence a little with you. And you, you can go to this paper that's open access in where with my colleague, Professor Marcus Pichi, we review this. But in general, in the literature, all the current intervention for gait, balance, and falls, I think we can stratify in two big domains no pharmacological interventions which include exercise going to train and so on and pharmacological intervention because they have been tried some medication for this in, pharma in no pharmacological interventions this is a busy slide but just to show you there is several interventions about quantity training dual task training combined exercise training um results are mixed some results are positive but all in general the sample size are very small in the studies. In fact, I will say one of the seminal studies have been led by Dr. Joe Bergisi, who compared sessions of cognitive training in a very small sample, 10 people received the intervention, 10 received the control. And he found that the computerized training, training, so all the people they put in a computer to improve cognition, they fall less than those that have usual care. And he replicated this with a larger sample and it published in the journal neurology but the original paper was in this small sample size and the same for some groups like a karen lee or Louis Berre, who are a colleague of me working here in, Ca in canada they're based in montreal in where they found that also computerized dual task training in order to improve attention and, and switching performance has like a transfer effect improved balance maybe lateral maybe big balance so there's some evidence that may improve at least surrogate marker falls improving gait and balance and those uh, cognitive trainings in general are related to 
dual tasking and, 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 and in where do you switch attention very quickly and you improve the, the, the executive function. Concerning the pharmacological intervention, there is also few studies um, um, uh, testing amphetamines for the improvement, particularly in the attention, the methylphenylalditarine as an amphetamine, and they found positive results. The issue is those medications are very complicated to give in other people, right? And other people have tried, like in my group, have tried content enhancers, so those medications that stimulate cholinergic neurotransmission, and we found also some positive results in MCI and Alzheimer's, and mainly the most important results are coming in, in Parkinson's disease. But just to show you some results in our study, we used donepecil in those people with MCI that didn't have indication for donepecil. Um, that was in a small study, proof of principle randomized control trial, 30 people in each room, in, in each in each uh, group. And we found that donepecil, after intervention, increased gait performance, particular gait performance with dual tasking. So those receiving the medication, they can walk and talk better, that don't, don't receive the medications. And you can see here how um, those receiving the medications in green reduce the cost, they have less cost, so the reduction in dual task was 10%, while those getting uh, the placebo, they got worse after the, the intervention. Importantly, when we look for actual faults, which is not the primary outcome in the study because it's a principle, we found those taking, you know, the nepecil, they reduce fall. Again, results are not significant, but interesting, I will say, proof of principle concerning about the concept that if we improve some aspect of cognition, like a cholinergic neurotransmission, we may reduce fall. Doesn't mean we need to get the nepecil people now to, to reduce falls today. I will review that because there is a caution here. Those are small studies and, and, and can be a publication bias, but probably negative studies were not published, right? So again, but I think as a proof of principle is coming back to this concept that Bernard Eisen postulated about falls as a result of brain failure, that perhaps we can use some medication to stimulate some area of cognition to reduce fall. And this is an area for future research for sure. So what we do when one study is not enough? Those studies are very small, uh, you know, can be publication bias. We try to do a meta-analysis. We try to look for all those studies and to make a, a, a bigger sample size. Uh, and a group in McMaster performed a systematic review and meta-analysis that was recently published in BMZ Geriatric in 2021, in where they, um, it was uh, led by Racy, but also my colleague Susan Moore Hunter, is part of this paper, in where they review the evidence in the community when we target other people, all older people with mild to moderate cognitive impairments, so MCI and mild dementia. And, and they look for faults as an outcome, but also proxy of faults or surrogates or intermediate outcomes like fear of falling or perceived real falling, balance. Or equilibrium, and also gain the speed or, or the time up and go, the tag. And they found that the evidence that uh, use fall prevention intervention in the community to prevent falls is very low, but there is very good evidence to moderate, to prevent, to improve those surrogate markers. And mainly in those meta analyses for the fear of falling or perceived risk of falls, the meta analysis shows a pull effect, quite interesting, a pull effect of 0.73. So perhaps, you know, <clears throat> a 27% improvement in that perception of fear of falling while trying to do those interventions or multi-domain intervention. And I will go to the intervention later on, but the majority of the interventions include some kind of exercises and dual task exercises, some that include diet. They, they include all the multi-domain interventions in that. For balance, they found the same. In fact, the effect, the pull effect is better. The pull effect is almost 40%, 30, 30, 30, 34%. And for gait speed, they found that was 74%. And you can see the confidence intervals are all significant. And the same for, for the tag. So there is some evidence for those 
systematic reviews that we review here that combine in multi-domain interventions and all the time including exercise parameterization may have effect moderate evidence in gait, balance, fear of falling, and low evidence in some studies may prevent fall or not. So it still is a challenge. But other systematic review meta-analysis, when they look just for pure exercises in this systematic review, they found that there is a trend, and that was published in 2021 also by the Nature and Aging, for combining physical exercises to prevent falls in cognitive impairment, particularly with mild cognitive problems or mild dementia. And I think when they include people with moderate or severe dementia, that's the reason the coughing interval across the one, as you can see in this forest plot. So emerging evidence, particularly in those that have mild to moderate dementia, that we use combined intervention, multifactorial, particularly to be exercise part of the component, you may have an effect, you may be a difference. So, that's a positive change since the classical meta-analysis done by Oliver in 2007, in where new evidence show not only exercise are feasible to do in MCI or mild dementia, but also may have an effect. So what are the conclusions we talk? Well, I'm going to analyze first, what is the level of evidence? And later, what can you do practically for your patient with cognitive impairment to decrease the risk of falls? I would say that, unfortunately, the global effect of fall prevention in this population in cognitive impairment still remains a little elusive. However, exercise interventions are effective at improving fall risk factors, fall raised in people in the community, cognitive impairment in the community, some people with MCI and mild dementia, and in some in nursing homes, but not in the very impaired one, not in the very impaired one. And high quality studies with longer follow up may be needed to confirm all these trends and interesting findings we found. But the second level, what you can do for your patient? Well, first, as a recommendation, and there's expert opinion, that we try to make the case how cognition affects fall risk, also in those labeled as cognitive normal. So we believe cognitive evaluation should be part of the comprehensive fall risk assessment for all older adults, not only for those labeled with cognitive impairment. Clinicians, particularly you want to treat those with cognitive impairment, should involve the patient and the caregiver in planning for prevention because there is evidence showing that those interventions, the fidelity to the intervention and the results are better if the caregiver is involved, but also if the patient likes to do the exercise. When you try to provide an exercise treatment, you need to speak with your patient which is the more feasible to do, what is the exercise they want to do, and when you get good fidelity, you get good results. So there is evidence about that, that caregivers and patients should be involved in the planning or the strategy to prevent falls in the coming impact. As I said before, exercises interventions are feasible and reduce fall risk falls. So should be the cornerstone of the treatment, adding other interventions may have additional effects according to some meta-analysis. But also in general, we should do general actions that could help to preserve cognition and prevent falls. So we need to review the medication. We, could, we do know sedatives, benzodiazepine and psychopharma medication, reduce processing speed, reduce cap switching capacity, make dual tasking worse, so increase risk of falling. We should provide a strength, balance, and quality training exercise when available, if your system has that available. We should correct vision and hearing problems because the sensory inputs are very important for all those strategies we review in the neurobiology of falls. We should correct vitamin D deficiency. It seems that hypersupplementation of vitamin D doesn't have an effect, but if you have deficiency, yes, if we give you vitamin D, we can improve your risk of falls. You have vitamin D deficiency. So we need to be sure our patients are vitamin D repleted. And we should check home and remove hassle for any safe walking in order to avoid this problem that happened with aging and cognitive impairment with obstacle negotiation that we review. So as a final summary, I would like to convey, and I hope I convince you with this evidence and this talk that cognitive deficits, exercise fall risk in everyone, even in those with normal cognition, that the fall risk screen should include 
cognitive process evaluation, particular attention, inhibition, effective function. That cognitive uh, impaired treatments in the population to prevent falls should include physical exercise, focusing lower limb and strength and balance. And there is some evidence that cognitive training may improve all this, but it's a complementary approach. And there is some publication bias, a small study, something that still needs to be fully proven in larger trials. Uh, if you want to learn more, we have a book that we edit with Professor Richard Camicelli about false and cognition. Also, we are leading the four words guideline for prevention and manage all the adults. You can go to our website to learn more about this, but we hope our guidance and recommendation will be presented in September 30, 2022, during the European Union Genetic Medicine Conference. So we wait for you there and in order to share our results and recommendations. And just to finish, I will give you my email. I'm thanking all the people in my laboratory, my co-investigators and the agencies that pay the bill for my research, and I'm open for any of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manuel, Professor Montero Dasso, for your excellent presentation. It's really the, the, the cornerstone. Uh, and we are beginning with the QA, QA uh, sessions. We have eight, 10 minutes for, for some questions. See, we received one of them. That is, uh, congratulations to you and, and, and for me for the conference and, and for, for Professor Kaplan. Uh, uh, congrats in, 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 in this, in this uh, way. This um, DL Maria is a colleague from our old hospital. Ask, could the evaluation of the impact of dual or multitasking in walking help us to individualize the recommendations to prevent falls? Is training to improve multitasking ability in a safe environment possible or useful? Well, thank you very much uh, for all the comments. Uh, we are honored that we are able to name this lecture in honor to the uh, Professor Roberto Kaplan. And um, very nice to see you, Maria. Thank you for your question. Very interesting question. Dual task gate, uh, as you know, is an area close to me because based on my research, dual task gate as a predictor of falls in some populations, it seems is better than single gate. In other populations, it's the same. Some systematic review showed that your task gate doesn't add any extra information to single task. Although uh, a new systematic review where they compare studies using both tests, the single test and the dual task gate, there is uh, some evidence that show that, but it still is not very categorical. Concerning dual task training and how it can help in your individual operation, I will say, as I see in my own patient, that the dual task gait is very, very impaired. I do know that patient has some problems in the cognitive, cognitive motor interface and a high risk of fall. When we try to retrain that, the studies showing positive results are very small. They're very small studies. There is a couple of randomized control trials done for the group of Professor Schreck in Germany showing positive results. Um, in general, they work with combined with exercises. So when you provide physical exercises combined with kind of dual task training, it seems um, may prevent fall, particularly sequentially. Or in studies, when they do con concurrent and concomitant, the results are not as good. One hypothesis because the, the patient gets distracted, cannot focus and do the physical exercise very well because trying to do dual tasking. But again, uh, there is some emerging evidence that sequential dual task training may prevent falls in some people with cognitive impairment. Uh, still, a small studies with larger uh, randomized control trials. Interestingly, in people with Parkinson's disease, dual task training with virtual reality, there is larger studies uh, um, from the group of uh, Alan Mirman. Uh, in, involving more than 100 participants in each arm, showing that uh, that is feasible and may reduce falls. So again, small studies in general population may be an impact in those that have the cognitive motor interface uh, impair. Larger studies with a stronger evidence in Parkinson's disease. Okay. 
Thank you, uh, Manuel. Another question from uh, Dr. Luis Macken. This if functional exercises from the age of 15 in advance should be required or work for all persons in general? When functional exercises? Yes. Well, depends how we, uh, how we define functional exercises. So if functional exercises, goal-oriented exercises, in where you do exercise with a goal, yes, there is some evidence, particularly the group of Joe Bergis in New York, is showing goal-oriented exercises may improve surrogate market of falls, like um, gait speed or gait variability. I don't know any uh, goal-oriented exercises that reduce falls. Um, in general, for example, we do know that exercises involving balance displacement or involving strengthening the lower limbs, following, for example, the Otego protocol, uh, the classical Otego protocol, are very useful to prevent falls in the community. And also in some patients with mild to moderate cognitive impairment. With severe cognitive impairment, it's more challenging, it's not working very well, but all physical exercises that involve balance retraining, but also uh, strengthening the lower limbs, prevent falls in the community, and mild cognitive impairment and mild dementia. Goal-oriented exercise is that functional exercise, the question. Uh, there is a study showing the improved surrogate marker falls, like a gate speed, but I don't know any studies having falls as a, as a very hard outcome. Okay, we have no much time, just only 30 seconds. Uh, and another, another question by Dr. Maida Villarba is, how can we prescribe exercise? It's just similar to, to, to this. But if you have uh, no, 30 seconds. We need to say that prescribed exercises is like a prescribed antibiotic, right? We don't prescribe antibiotics. We prescribe in a specific antibiotic, ciprofloxacin, in a specific dose, and so on. Exercise is the same. And there is several barriers for exercise, because sometimes you can prescribe the exercises, but the patient or the participant may not do it. So there is several stages. Um, in general, exercise that prevent falls are those, as I said before, that involve balance retraining or displacement of the center of gravity, or those that involve uh, strength training of the lower limbs. Walking is an excellent exercise, not necessarily will prevent falls. Upper limb exercises or going to do a strength, train, a strength training in upper limbs, no necessarily will predict falls. So all the that prevent falls are those involved balance, center of gravity displacement, and lower limbs, lower limbs um, resistant training. In the World Fall Guidelines, if you go to our website, I'm trying to put resources and toolkits, not only how to pro provide exercises, but mainly follow Tai Chi or the, or the protocol, but also which are the barriers and how you can personalize the exercise, because something we do know is that if you, when you prescribe the exercises in your population and you involve the patient, you involve the participants of the exercise and you speak about the preferences and you address the barriers, we have better adherence to the exercises and better outcomes. And that is part also our new guidelines is presenting that with some toolkits and resources that is going to be in our website after September 30th. I hope I will respond to your question. Okay, we have no more time. Thank you very much again, Manuel. It's an excellent conference, and of course, one of the cornerstones of the geriatric medicine in the future is to understand the force mechanism and association. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, guys.